Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here today to talk to you about this very big challenge, climate change and solving for it. We really only have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, or suffering. And I so badly want to avoid this century the suffering part, so I really want to talk about mitigation. What's exciting about mitigation is not only is it a powerful opportunity, it might be the biggest economic opportunity in history. There really are incredible things that can happen if we work on mitigation together. This all started with the Industrial Revolution. Like every technology, there's great pros and cons. The Industrial Revolution brought incredible growth of GDP around the planet. You can see how it took off in the 1800s as this started in England and spread to the rest of the world. However, there was a con. The con was trash. Not only do we produce a huge amount of trash that we put into the ground every day, into landfills, each of the seven and a half billion people on Earth produce about one pound of trash per day. So seven and a half billion pounds of trash every day goes into landfills. However, each and every person on Earth puts 31 pounds of CO2 trash into the atmosphere. We put 31 times as much stuff invisibly into the atmosphere as we do into the ground. We're using this thin sliver of our beautiful atmosphere as our landfill for all of our trash, all of our fuel trash. That's caused some incredible changes. For all of human history, we've only had about 0.02% or 0.03% of CO2 in our atmosphere. In the last 100 years, it jumped to over 400. We just crossed 0.04%. We just crossed 415 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it's not stopping. It's going up 5 to 10 points every single year. It's dramatic how fast we're doing that. We're at historically high levels, and there's pretty much no turning back. I learned this fact recently, and I was staggered. The extra heat that we bring into the Earth, to the Earth and to the oceans, by that extra CO2 we put up there, is the equivalent energy of three Hiroshima bombs going off every second. It's just a staggering amount of extra energy, and that's why everything's warming up. When you, bring in those, when you have those extra greenhouse gases, bringing extra heat into the planet, it heats up. It's just simple. And we're doing it at a tremendous, tremendous rate. And the effects have been catastrophic. You've all seen them. We have more severe fires. We have more severe droughts. We have more severe storms. We have shorter winters. And there's really much worse to come, all from this extra CO2 we're putting up there. Well, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. And I watched, in 1973, the energy crisis then, where gasoline was rationed. You could only buy $5 of gasoline per day based on the digit of the day and the last digit of your license plate. And I saw mile-long lines of people waiting for their $5 of ration gasoline. I remember watching that as a child and thinking, this is insane. There's this one place on Earth where they're digging up the oil and it's trying to be distributed around the world and they could hold it back and people could not have their energy because of that. So I got really excited about solar energy even back then. And I started a small little business in high school called Solar Devices. I was making little kits and plans, selling them in the back of Popular Science magazine. And I actually paid my way through college selling these devices back in 1976. And I was really, really excited about this back then. And I've continued to be excited about it all my life. 23 years ago, I started Idealab as a technology incubator. And we started companies in all different areas. The whole goal was to create a business to start businesses. Well, we had a lot of success with those businesses, and that gave me the resources to go back and focus on this early passion of mine back from when I was a teenager. At Idealab, we've created more than 150 companies, and many of them have been in the clean technology space. What we look for at Idealab are big societal problems, things that are big and broken challenges, and then look for technology solutions to fix them. Well, I feel the biggest problem we have today is powering our planet renewably. It's also our biggest single opportunity, but it's our biggest problem. You've all heard about the dramatic decline in the cost of renewable energy. Wind and solar are going down dramatically. There's been a 22 times decline in the cost of wind energy over the last several decades, and a 200 times decline in the price of solar panels to make solar electricity. The problem is they now have beaten the price of fossil fuels, but at the wrong time of day. And what I mean by that is they only come when the wind is blowing and the sun is shining, not necessarily when we have our peak demand. We want our energy, our electrical power, whenever we want it, not necessarily on a sunny day. That's why fossil fuels still dominate. Diesel electricity costs 10 cents a kilowatt hour at large scale. Coal electricity costs 6 cents a kilowatt hour at large scale. The best combined cycle natural gas plants in the world cost 5 cents. But wind is 3 cents and 2 cents for solar. So they've won, but not at the right time. So what do we need to solve this? The final hurdle to make renewable energy actually surpass all fossil fuels is low-cost storage. We need to be able to shift the energy from when it comes to when we want it. 
So when we have a solution to store energy, which when added to the price of solar and wind, still yields base load power, base load meaning whenever we want it, that's cheaper than fossil fuels, it'll take over the planet. So that's what we have to do over the next decade. And we're really, really close. I'll show you where we are right now. There's only three ways to store energy. There's chemically, with batteries of all types. There's thermally, with hot or cold. Or there's mechanically, gravity, compressed air, flywheels. These are all the methods we've ever used. They have different costs, and they're used in different methods, but it's all we have available. Let me show you what, what these cost right now. So flywheels cost 45 cents a kilowatt hour to store electricity, so when you add that to wind or solar, it's way too expensive, way more than fossil fuels. Flow batteries and lithium-ion batteries are coming down in price, but still at 25 cents, way too expensive. You can't compete with fossil fuels with batteries plus solar or wind. The lowest cost storage in history is pumped hydro. That's actually pumping water up a mountain. That's having a reservoir at the top of a mountain, a reservoir at the bottom, or building a dam, pumping water up, and then letting it flow back down to generate electricity through a turbine when you need it. That still costs 17 cents, way too expensive. 98% of all the energy we store in the world is stored this way because it's the cheapest. But you can't build any more of it. Why? Every good site on Earth where there's a mountain and a reservoir on the top and a reservoir on the bottom, someone's bought it and turns it into this already. So it's gone. And, and you can't afford to dig the reservoir and you can't afford to build the mountain, so there's no other good way to get this cheap pumped hydro. But even if you could build more, it's still too expensive. The tipping point we need is three cents. We need to be five times cheaper than the cheapest ever. But if we can get to three cents, then we add that to solar and wind and we beat fossil fuels, it'll be a trillion dollar opportunity and it really can change the planet. So because of that huge opportunity, I've been working very hard on that. Everybody's working very hard on that. Uh, uh, I feel we now need to devote the same amount of attention to storage now as we have over the last three decades to, re to making the energy. We need to store it. Making it is not the problem anymore. It's, it's holding on to it for, for using when we need it. We need every solution, not just the one I'm going to talk to you about. We need many, many people working on this, and we need to do it fast. I feel we need to do this in the next 10 years. You've heard all the reports about how urgent this is. I really feel this has to be done in the next 10 years and deployed at scale in the next 10 years. So here are the things that I started working on to do this. It took me 10 tries to get to something that even worked. The first idea was, well, if you can't have a mountain to pump the water up, what about if you made a silo out of concrete and you filled the water up in that and let it flow down? Well, you can do it, but it doesn't work. It's too expensive. It's five times too expensive. It costs more than $1,000 per kilowatt hour because of the amount of cement you need to build that tower. Then I started looking at many, many other ideas. All didn't work. My sixth idea, which also didn't work, but was better, it was two times better, was to uh, borrow some ideas from the Romans and instead of making the concrete in a silo, make it more like arches. The arches were a brilliant invention 2,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, with the aqueducts. And building a building out of all aqueducts, you can pump water up into that and actually beat the price of building a concrete silo by a factor of two, but still too expensive. So I kept on looking at more things and more things in different ways. And then we came up with a way of using a crane, in this case a computer-controlled crane, to lift blocks and stack them. If you lift the blocks and stack them, then you don't have to build a mountain. The mountain is basically being built by the crane. You get the gravity storage from the weight that you're lifting up, and effectively you get something that looks like this. Turns out it's a six-arm computer-controlled crane that could be stationed near a windmill or near a PV plant, near a solar farm. And all the energy that comes from the wind or the sun is lifting up the blocks when you have excess power and then lowering the blocks back down to the ground when you need it. And this is what it looks like close up, and this is what it looks like in the sequence. So over on the left is with all the blocks low, and then as the sun is shining or the wind is blowing in the middle, the blocks are getting lifted up and building a taller tower. And then when you want to discharge or release energy, you get the energy back out. Well, this allowed us to get down to three and a half cents. So we're only a half a cent away from that magic number. But even at three and a half cents, we're pretty much five times better than, than the pumped hydro, and we don't need a mountain, and we're way better than batteries. And it's very, very simple technology. It really can be scaled. So we're really working hard to scale this as fast as we can, because this could be one factor in really allowing us to switch to renewable energy. If you take the 3.5 cents that we're at right now, plus 2.3 cents for a low-cost solar farm, you're at 5.8 cents, you're actually cheaper than coal. So even today, we could be cheaper than coal, and there's no reason to have another uh, a coal plant. When the whole reason for a coal plant is that you can run 24-7, but now this can run 24-7 as well. With the storage, you can now take solar and make it run 24-7. So that's the first step. We have to make all of our energy renewably, but we also have to clean up the atmosphere, because we're in bad shape right now at 415 parts per million. Cleaning up the atmosphere is very hard. There are a lot of people trying different methods to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. I think we actually have to go backwards to, to try and make the Earth more inhabitable. The reason it's so hard 
is the CO2 in the atmosphere is 415 parts per million. That's, that's a lot, way more than we've ever had in history by a factor of two. But it takes a whole Colosseum's worth of air to take out one ton of CO2, meaning you have to move a lot of air to filter it to take out the CO2, a huge amount. And that would take fans or, or methods of moving all that air cost effectively to make it work. So that's a big, big challenge. And that's to take out one ton of CO2. We're putting 38 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere each year. So to take out 38 billion, it would be a huge, huge monumental effort, but one that I feel is very worthwhile. So I'm working on a technology that would use cheap solar energy out in the desert, using very inexpensive land, adding the storage to it that we talked about, in a combination that would take CO2 out of the atmosphere at 10 times lower than our current cost. At 10 times lower than our co current cost, it's cost effective. You could actually take the CO2 out and use it to make fuel, use it to make products, and have that scale on a very big way. Effectively, what that's doing is it's turning desert into forest, but in only one hundredth the land. And what I mean by that is not literally turning desert into forest, but, but figuratively in the following sense. 146 acres of forest will take out about a ton of CO2 per day. But one acre of desert with this technology would also take out a ton of CO2 per day, not need any water, not need any fertilizer, not need any tending. It would just work on the solar energy. So amazingly, a 390 mile square in the Sahara Desert, and of course you wouldn't put it just in that one location, you could put it in deserts any anywhere, but a 390 mile square could zero out the entire 38 billion tons of CO2 we put in the atmosphere. So that would negate every plane, every truck, every car, every coal plant, every everything, every, all food, plant, animals, methane, everything could be eliminated by a 390 mile square. So the goal is to try and achieve that, and I think we have, we have to achieve that in the next decade. It's gonna be very, very hard, but we need a lot of partners, a lot of collaboration, and I'm hopefully going to inspire other people to try and do that, because we really, really need to work on that. We need to make clean technologies irresistible. The way you make them irresistible is you make them just make money. If you make them just make money, then they'll scale like crazy. You won't need any laws to spread them. You won't need any politicians to dictate it. It will just happen because it's economical. And I think that really can make a big difference. Just as one example, we just announced that Energy Vault technology at DLD and Davos in January, and we already have $9 billion of demand for that. So that just shows that when there's economic uh, pull, you don't have to push it on anybody. They just want it because all of a sudden people can make um, renewable plants that are like coal plants, meaning they run 24-7, but you can do them in remote areas. You don't have to build them at large scale. This is why I think this is so important. This is the right time. You can be ridiculed for having an innovative idea ahead of your time, and it, and it will be, but it will then be violently opposed, and then finally it's made accepted as self-evident. We have to fight to make this be self-evident. And why this is so important is two reasons. We've heard this over and over again today. We heard it just in the last session. Talent is evenly distributed, but opportunity is not. Renewable energy is evenly distributed. Fossil fuels are not. Renewable energy, sun and wind, is the most evenly distributed natural resource on Earth. So this allows people who don't have access to energy, like all of us in this room. All of us in this room have plenty of energy to make our lives comfortable. The lights, the air conditioning, our cars, our, our travel, we have it. If you bring that to everybody else, that so equalizes the planet. It's such a great equalizer for everybody. And I really think that not only that, we should give back a planet to our children like the one we inherited. When I was 15 and I saw those lines, the CO2 in the atmosphere was 315 parts per million. Now it's 415. If we can find a way to use renewable energy and go backwards, we could give our, our kids the same planet we got. This is my mission in life. I'm really, really passionate about this. I'd love to find ways to work with others of you here to try and make this a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you.